Okay, well, good morning or good evening uh, or good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Ryohinata Yamaguchi, Project Assistant Professor at the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Tokyo, and also Executive Director at the RCAST Open Laboratory for Emergent Strategies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session today. Just as one logistical announcement, um, if you would like to ask some questions, uh, please feel free to put it into the Q&A box in Zoom, and I'll handle those accordingly in the second half of the session. Uh, before we proceed with the event for today, uh, I would like to call up uh, Professor Ikeuchi Satoshi, uh, Chair of Roles, uh, to give his opening remarks. Uh, so Professor Ikeuchi, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Ryo. Uh, good morning uh, for the audience in Japan and good afternoon in the US. My name is Satoshi Ikeuchi, Professor of the Division of Religion and Global Security at the RCAST Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology of the University of Tokyo. I'm the founding chair of a think tank within the university uh, named Rhodes, our guest open laboratory for emergence strategies. Uh, let me congratulate the launch of a new project within Rhodes in our think tank uh, and uh, Dr. Ryo Hinata Yamaguchi on uh, policy research uh, on the Indo-Pacific affairs. Uh, I make my, my introductory remarks uh, uh, just uh, as short as possible and let Dr. Ryo explain his own project and intention and scope later. But uh, first, let me introduce briefly the entire concept of our think tank, Rhodes. Uh, which we have set up in, in 2020. Uh, uh, our think tank is meant for a open laboratory. Uh, and so we, we give uh, um, research scholars from all over the world, not within the University of Tokyo, but uh, universities inside and outside Japan to discuss emerging issues in the international uh, security. Um, we have been already conducting uh, vigorous research activities in, mainly in five study groups uh, tackling with China and revisionist powers, US and the shaken global order, uh, Middle East and Islam, and emerging uh, topics of security studies. And now Dr. Ryo is launching our research, uh, a policy research project, uh, mainly uh, working on Indo-Pacific affairs. So, uh, the, the new, so I, I, in this occasion, I, I'd like to thank Dr. Zach Cooper uh, for his appearance at the podium. Um, uh, so uh, introductions and uh, um, further introduction to our new project is up to Dr. Ryo. So, um, uh, so you, get, you have your microphone again. Thank you very much for uh, all of you for your attendance in this uh, uh, special uh, lecture and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takeuchi. Uh, so today, uh, you know, the Japan-US alliance faces new challenges and uncertainties. The nature of the threats that we face today are becoming ever more complex, not only because of greater aggression by the adversaries and competitors, but also, you know, the competition and the conflict taking place in military and law enforcement domains, um, as well as in economic, public communication, and media domains. Thus, against this backdrop, the Japan-U.S. alliance requires more innovative strategies and readiness to better deal with the threats and vulnerabilities of today and tomorrow. And that is why at Rolls, uh, we established a tabletop exercises project that aims to study the current and future Indo-Pacific security environment and simulate scenarios that hopefully will contribute to the Japan-U.S. alliance in the future. 
And to officially launch the Tabletop Exercises project, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zach Cooper, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Zach also teaches at Georgetown University and Princeton University, uh, co-directs the Alliance for Securing Democracy and co-hosts the Net Assessment Podcast, which is a really uh, you know, great series. Zach has published and presented extensively on U.S. Uh, security strategies and also in the Pacific security issues. Um, and he's one of the most influential thinkers in the United States, which is why I thought he's the perfect person uh, to invite for this particular session. So Zach, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and and um, I, you know, I look forward to uh, chatting with you today. Well, thank you, Rio. It's wonderful to get a chance to be here. And uh, you're an old friend, and I'm so happy to, to get an opportunity to talk with you and the rest of the audience uh, this morning in Japan and, and obviously tonight here in Washington. Um, I thought I would open by just making a couple of brief remarks about where I think the U.S.-Japan alliance is and maybe where it's going, um, which is to say that the United States has said that Asia is the pacing region, the most important region for the United States. And if that's true, in many ways, Japan is the pacing ally. It's the most important ally for the United States in the most important region. And so when we think about Japan and the US-Japan alliance, I think it should be with that in mind. But the question is whether the US-Japan alliance is prepared today to meet the challenges that we have in front of us. And I think there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and, and here, let me just point to two items where um, I, I think we have uh, some, some real thinking to do on the architecture of the alliance. So if you think about the other major US alliances around the world, uh, and here I'm thinking in, primarily about the NATO alliance, uh, about the US South Korea alliance, and the US Australia alliance. In each of those alliances, the United States and its allies have either combined operations or combined capability development. So in the NATO alliance, we have both. We have combined operations. We have one commander that handles all operations for all NATO forces, whether they're American or Canadian, British, French, German, Latvian, they all fall under one commander. Uh, and we also have something called Allied Command Transformation, which focuses on building up the kinds of capabilities that we need on the defense side over the long term. So we have both operational cooperation and technology development cooperation within NATO. In Asia, it's a little bit different. With South Korea, the United States has a combined forces command, as Rio knows well. Um, and this is a combined command with South Korea and with some other UN forces through UN command. It does not, with Korea, however, have a combined capability development uh, architecture. So it's basically missing half of what we have with NATO. Uh, the same is true with Australia. The United States does not have combined operational uh, command with Australia, but we do have now an increasingly combined capability development project, which we're calling AUKUS, the US-Australia-United Kingdom cooperation. So what's interesting here is you would imagine that the United States and Japan, as the perhaps the two closest allies, certainly the most important ally for the United States in the most important region, would have at least one, maybe both of those attributes. And we have neither. We don't have combined operational coordination. Um, we don't have combined capability development. And so I think this points to the reality that yes, the US-Japan alliance is in very good shape, and the Biden administration should get a lot of credit for this. I think the Trump administration and the Suga administration uh, cooperated fairly well as they did with the, with the Abe administration. But we have a lot of work to do to actually get the alliance prepared for the challenges we're gonna face over the next couple of decades. And the fact that we say this is our most important ally in the most important region, but we don't have operational cooperation in terms of combined operations, nor do we have combined capability development, I think should be a reminder that we still have a long way to go to 
to build the architecture that the Alliance needs. So Rio, hand it back to you and looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you. Yeah, and certainly like we met, I think we first met back in 2012 now. Uh, in fact, here in Tokyo, uh, and it was in a workshop that specifically talked about, again, the United States and the alliances uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, when we look back then, and when we look at the situation now, it seems that, you know, the flashpoints that we often talk about haven't really changed, you know, whether it be the East, South China Seas, Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Straits, um, and even on the Eurasian continent, you know, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, it's a lot worse, but we had some bad feelings about what's going to go on there, um, you know, uh, uh, on the Eurasian continent. And so, but the thing is, like, you know, although we've been looking at the same flashpoints, it's not business as usual, uh, because we see the exacerbation or acceleration of the conflicts uh, in those flashpoints uh, because of the new measures that states are taking. Um, not just reconfigured strategies, but also new emerging technologies, uh, more aggressive employment of hybrid warfare that has definitely evolved with social media and so forth. Um, and so we see you know, more going on in the same flash ones that we've been dealing with for you know, decades now. Um, you know, China, they're not just modernizing their force at a much faster rate, but they're more aggressive, obviously, as we see. North Korea, they continue to diversify their readiness um, and their military modernization seems to have picked up some pace. Um, US, and also if we look at the US and its allies, they're doing more, which is good, but it's still, nonetheless, we have to admit that it's changing the texture of regional security um, in the Indo-Pacific to some extent, uh, to, depending on how we look at it. So when we look at those things, like, you know, we've, you and I, we've always talked about this. We see all these dots out there, but as you and I know, it's more important to connect those dots. So I was wondering what your take is on some of the key trends um, and developments in the region, if you were to connect those dots that we have. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So when I think about the US-Japan alliance and where we've focused over the last 15 years, I think actually it's been a real shift from one uh, flashpoint to another. So from 2010 through maybe 2014, the U.S.-Japan alliance was really focused on the East China Sea. We had the crises around the Senkakus in 2010 and 2012. Then in 2014, President Obama made, I think, a very wise comment to be quite explicit about the fact that the Senkaku Islands fall within Article 5 of the Mutual Defense, of, sorry, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, and therefore fell under uh, U.S. security commitments to Japan. That, I think, uh, those four years were quite focused on the East China Sea and the Senkakus in, in particular. Then we had a period where actually the attention shifted south to the South China Sea, right? So uh, beginning really in 2013, spanning up through 2015 and 2016, China was building up the seven features in the Spratly Islands that it now has made into large bases. Um, I was part of the team at the Center for Strategic and International Studies that watched this very closely. And, you know, it was quite notable to see how fast China moved in the South China Sea. And we, as allies, paid a lot of attention to what was going on there. Of course, after that period, we had the period of fire and fury, right, uh, with North Korea, where Donald Trump turned up the temperature on North Korea and then turned it back down pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, a couple of years during the Trump administration where it certainly seemed that there was a possibility of conflict on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that brings us to today where the focus has once again shifted from the East China Sea to the South China Sea to North Korea and now to Taiwan. And my expectation is that the US-Japan alliance is going to remain focused on Taiwan for the foreseeable future. And there are a couple of reasons for this. First, geography. The reality, as you all know well in Tokyo, is that Taiwan is just remarkably close to Japan's southwestern islands. And whether you're living in Ishigaki or Yonaguni, Miyako or Okinawa, it's hard to ignore that reality. 
And so the more pressure that Taiwan comes under, the more I think the alliance will feel a need to respond and to respond really with capabilities in the Southwestern islands. So geography is the first part. Uh, second, I do expect more political pressure from China on Taiwan as the years go by. And I don't think that, I'm not one that is worried about a China-Taiwan conflict this year. I think that's very unlikely with the party Congress coming up later this year in Beijing. But I am worried about what happens in future years, especially heading into an election in 2024 in Taiwan that could be quite tense and full of uh, threats across the strait from Beijing to Taipei to try and shape that election. So I think there's all of the um, attributes of a real crisis brewing, potentially leading into 2024. And finally, I think uh, there's a leadership element here too, which is that Xi Jinping has made clear that he's going to make uh, gaining control over Taiwan a top priority for the rest of his administration. And it might not be the very top priority, but it's certainly high on the list. And so I think this is something that's gonna draw a huge amount of attention for American leaders going forward. You see this from the American Congress, which has talked more about Taiwan in the last year or two than I can ever remember. Um, you see this in the Biden administration, which is increasingly worried about Taiwan scenarios. So at the end of the day, I think we've got a geography that leads us to be concerned about possible cross-strait conflict. We've got political factors, especially over the next few years. And then we've got leadership, which you know, in some ways is the most important as we're seeing right now with Vladimir Putin. Um, and so I, I think for all of those reasons, I expect that as much as we've spent the last 15 or 20 years focused on the East China Sea and South China Sea and North Korea, I think the next 15 years are really going to be quite focused on Taiwan. And our job is to make sure that the Alliance is prepared for those types of contingencies. Yeah, great point. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, the M line, right, regarding that uh, the contingency uh, in, in the Taiwan Straits. And, you know, I've heard you talk about this a lot in podcasts, uh, in various other uh, webinars and, and so forth. Um, and I also agree with you that, you know, we don't have to worry about like an invasion of Taiwan, let's say, in you know, this year. Um, and I, I'd say like, personally, I'd say that they probably wouldn't dare to do that at least for quite some time. 2030 is probably the period I'm really going to you know, worry about some kind of military invasion. Uh, as I said, to, in 2024, I see China turning up the temperature and uh, putting on more pressure. But when it comes to actual military invasion, um, you know, this is something that's fairly delicate for the Chinese side as well, because they need to get that right um, you know, in terms of military readiness and also you know, other various areas of capacity that we, uh, that we have to think about. But the thing is, yeah, this sort of goes back to an early, uh, earlier point that you raised as well. Yeah, we've shifted attention to, to Taiwan. I definitely agree that this is the most important agenda for the US-Japan alliance, at least for now, um, and for the foreseeable future. But at the same time, and I'm going to challenge you here a little bit, this is something that you know we've been seeing for a long time. And we can't just say, you know, oh, because China's getting more aggressive, you know, we're paying more attention to this. And that's probably something that, you know, we can uh, uh, think about there as well. Now, before, you know, we really go into that point, um, I guess we should just shift our attention a little bit and talk more about the, you know, then, now that we've sort of got the ideas about the situation in the Pacific, and we will come back to that point about Taiwan in a second. But now that we've got some ideas about the situation in the Pacific, uh, let's process this a bit. And think about again the threats to and the vulnerabilities um, of the Japan US alliance. So let's start with the threats to alliance. And again, this is where we can come back to that uh, Taiwan point. You know, again, the question I always have, and I've been wondering about this ever since we first met um, in, in that workshop back in 2012 um, um, on GMF. You know, what has taken so long for the Japan US alliance? 
to recognize that China is a real competitor here, or even I'll say the threat. Now, sometimes I feel, you know, this was like longer with you, even back in 2012. And now in 2021, 2022, we're really taking Taiwan a lot more seriously when we should get it more seriously 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago almost. Because we've always known that the CCP has eyes on Taiwan. So I was wondering if, I can, uh, if we can talk about that a little bit. And then also, of course, other threats to the alliance. And then we'll move on to vulnerabilities. But let's talk about the threats to the alliance. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. You know, why has it taken so long for the United States and Japan to wake up to the challenge that we face from China? And I, I don't think this is an easy question to answer. It's something I've thought a lot about. I, I think there are really two factors. One is uh, related to China and the other is related to the US and Japan um, and, and other third parties that we cooperate with. So the China factor. In my view, it wasn't completely clear in 2010 or even maybe 2012 when Xi Jinping took over what kind of leadership team we were going to see from China um, over the last decade. Um, I think very few people would have expected in 2012 that Xi Jinping would be made you know, either general secretary for a third term or chairman of the party uh, this year, which is what we expect to happen. So uh, one of the changes has just been a change within China. I think this is a different set of leaders of the Communist Party than most people would have expected to see. They're incredibly confident. They're quite convinced that the United States and I think Japan as well are in terminal decline, that the American system in particular is failing that American democracy is failing, the American economy is weak, and that China is rising and will continue to rise. And I think that degree of confidence is just not something that was easily uh, imagined maybe a decade ago, certainly not two decades ago. Um, so, you know, one factor is just that I think China has changed. And I, I know that's, you know, hard for some people to believe, especially if you go back and you look at Chinese behavior in 2007, 2008, you know, you can see the seeds of some of what has happened over the last decade. Um, at the end of, of that period, especially around the financial crisis in 2008, but I, I don't think it was really until maybe 2015 that we started seeing just how assertive the new Chinese leadership was going to be. And, you know, the, the idea that you would see China pressing ahead on issue after issue, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Sino-Indian border, uh, Japan through much, much of the uh, 2010s, you know, pushing on the South China Sea through much of that period as well, and ratcheting up the pressure, not just on the United States and on Australia, but on Lithuania, right, on Taiwan, all at the same time. This is just not what most experts expected. Um, so I think the first thing is that China has changed, and maybe we should have seen that change coming, but we didn't. Um, you know, there were some of us that expected some of this to happen, but I think it's happened faster even than those of us who are fairly pessimistic would have expected. So that's the first factor. The second factor, I think, is mostly within our own societies and, and with our, within our own governments. And, and I'll speak mostly from the US perspective here, but I, I think for the last 10 or 20 years, the, UN, the United States has been remarkably distracted. And look, I, I was in the Bush White House. I understand that many of these distractions were of our own making, right? Um, the Iraq war, I would certainly count in that category, um, but also, you know, the 20 year war that we fought in Afghanistan as well. So for much of that period, the United States was fighting two major conflicts. And yes, we knew that China was the long term challenge, but um, the United States was fairly distracted. And if you throw in the domestic divisions, especially around, you know, Donald Trump uh, and questions about American democracy, uh, you know, this is really a tough time for U.S. foreign policy experts to say, oh, we should be focusing all of our time on China. 
And um, I think you have similar challenges in Japan, of course. Um, in some ways, the Abe administration probably got this more right than, than anyone else because it was in power for so long and in such a strong position that it could really uh, assess changes over time. And it was less distracted than the United States was. So in many ways, Japan has been leading the United States on this issue in, in quite a important way. Um, I think what's happened in the last two or three years is that both Japan and the United States have realized that we don't have the ability anymore to continue being distracted given how rapidly China is pressing ahead on a variety of fronts. And so we've really seen a very rapid reassessment of political leaders in both capitals, but it's not just political leaders. I think the, the other element here is the economic leadership in both countries. So it was long said that in the US-China relationship, the business relationship was the ballast. It was the thing that held the relationship together. I think the same has been true in the Japan-China relationship. Now, over the last few years, I think we've started to see real questions asked in the business community about whether the business relationships are going to be trustworthy with China over the long term. So I think it's not just the political reassessment, it's also the business community's reassessment that's really forced a very rapid rethinking on China. And I expect that to continue over the next few years unless China changes its behavior quite remarkably. Yeah, and, and, and that's a really good point in the way that you know we see changes in China and changes in the United States and Japan. I think that's a really good point. Um, but again, like still, I often feel that, you know, whoever did scenario exercises and so forth back in 2000s and 2010s, you know, I wonder how they feel right now, you know, when they look at, you know, the, the, uh, in the China threat or sort the growth of China, that's something that I still have in mind, um, even when we did some scenario exercises together as well. Now, obviously China is a major concern, right? And it's one of, one of the threats, but it's not the only one. And there's, there's obviously, you know, quite a lot of others. Uh, you know, North Korea, Russia, and so forth. So when we look at North Korea and Russia, do you see the nature of the alliance changing in any ways? It's a really interesting question. Uh, so fascinatingly, if you read the new Indo-Pacific strategy that the United States just released about a week and a half ago, it's notable Russia is not mentioned once. Um, and... North Korea does appear, but it is not a main focus of that strategy. I think for the United States, the real focus of its efforts in the region is China. And um, leaders in Washington see the challenges from Moscow and Pyongyang in Asia as very secondary. And as a result, they think that these are also secondary issues for the US-Japan alliance which is not to say that we shouldn't be cooperating closely uh, on North Korea, for example, uh, or cooperating closely on Russia. I think we're, we're making progress in both regards, but that that's not really the way to measure success in the US-Japan alliance. So yes, I think many Americans would be quite happy to hear that Japan is going to go along with sanctions on Russia I think many Americans are happy to hear that we're seeing more cooperation on North Korea, whether it's dealing with the nuclear threat or the missile threat um, or trilateral cooperation with North, sorry, with Japan and the United States and South Korea. So those things are important, but my personal view is that those are not the critical elements of the US-Japan alliance anymore. They're important, but their side efforts. The main effort is really going to be Japan, uh, Japan US cooperation on China. And I, I think that is the reality driven just by the magnitude of the threats that we face in Asia. So um, I don't want to undermine the importance of staying aligned on North Korea policy or on Russia policy. Those, those are critical issues. 
But I think if we do well on North Korea and Russia, but we do badly on China, the alliance will have failed. And the reverse is not true. If we get our China policy right, but we struggle on North Korea or Russia, it wouldn't be ideal, but it's not the end of the world. Um, so I, I think, you know, from my perspective, the US-Japan alliance is really going to be more and more focused on China as the years go by. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, and regarding North Korea, it's really that the United States and Japan is, I wouldn't say perfect, but they're certainly, um, you know, fairly ready for the kinds of things that the North Koreans are going to do against the United States and Japan. Like, it's, you know, because, in other words, we can sort of calculate what's going to go on there, you know, um, you know, other than, let's say, some kind of regime collapse over in North Korea. You know, we have a rough idea about what, how to go about things when it comes to North Korea, whereas with China, that's not so. That's not to say that, you know, we, we were getting everything right on North Korea. There's still a lot of things that we do have to work out, particularly with the developments over there. But I definitely agree with you on the point that, you know, China is one that we have to get right because there's a lot of homework that we have to do on the U.S. side and Japanese side. Um, and that brings us to the next point, and that is the vulnerabilities. We talked about you know, the threats to the alliance, but also vulnerabilities of the alliance. So regarding the vulnerabilities of the alliance, um, you know, this is important because if we don't get this right, this is really going to undermine our readiness and our strategies towards you know, the threats that we face. Now, if we look at the latest Armitage 9 report, which came out in 2020, um, it looked a lot different from the one at, in 2012. And that, you know, shows that a lot has developed um, and that the alliance is moving along a good trajectory. Um, but at the same time, the question is, have we filled the vulnerabilities? Um, or are there new vulnerabilities that we see in the alliance, uh, you know, that has emerged in the last, let's say, uh, several years. What do you think there? Yeah, I, I would say in this regard, the biggest vulnerability in my view is really a political vulnerability, which is um, this concern, especially in the United States, that maybe Americans just are not supportive enough of maintaining ally and partner relationships globally right, that um, the Biden administration has certainly made this a top priority. Anytime you hear a Biden administration official talk about what's important in the world, the first thing they'll say is alliances and partnerships. And I'm fully supportive of that. But when you hear some Republicans, Donald Trump in particular, talk about their approach, um, they're actually often quite disdainful of alliances and partnerships, and they see them as burdens. And we heard this very often from the Trump administration. And I, I don't want to suggest that all Republicans think that. I certainly don't. You know, most, I think, uh, officials within the Trump administration didn't believe that. But there's a group of political leaders in the United States that's very skeptical of alliances. And, you know, their main critique is that the United States spends a lot of money to help its allies, and it doesn't get enough support from those allies to help themselves. And let me tell you, this is not the first time that anyone has said this. You can go back and Rio, you know this history better than I do, but um, you know you can go back and you can hear similar comments made by Jimmy Carter about South Korea uh, heading into 1980. You can hear similar comments made by Richard Nixon uh, around the end of the Vietnam War. Um, this has been a recurring theme from American presidents for decades. But what's different now is that you're hearing this sometimes from both parties. You're hearing it from the leftmost wing of the Democratic Party and sort of the rightmost wing of the Republican Party. And it's a, it's a call in some corners for the U.S. to retrench, to come back home, to not worry so much about allied security. I think that's the biggest risk to the alliance. And, and let me speak frankly for a minute. There is a danger that there, that those allies that are most under pressure, by which I mean the big US allies and partners, uh, Japan, Korea, Germany, France, that some of those allies don't pull their weight, right? And I, I think Japan has been doing everything it can to try and, for example, increase defense spending, 
to show that it is doing its part. But that's the biggest vulnerability in my view, that you could get an American president who says, why is Japan spending 1% of GDP on defense and we're spending three and a half? Why is Germany spending 1% of GDP on defense and the United States has so many troops in Germany? That is a risk. And I'm not suggesting that Japan should try and spend 2% of gross domestic product overnight, but I think we have to acknowledge that that in, is the big political risk to the alliance. It's, I'm not so worried about Japan getting cold feet and withdrawing from the alliance. Frankly, I don't think Japan has that option, right? Uh, China is threatening enough that Japan needs the United States. But I do worry about what could happen in 2024 if you get Donald Trump reelected or someone that holds his views. And I think Japan did a great job of managing Donald Trump last time around. But part of the way to manage that um, questioning of the US-Japan alliance is for D Japan to do everything it can to show that it's pulling its weight. And I, I think the Kishida administration has been pushing in this direction. So, so I'm hopeful that we're closing this area of vulnerability. But to me, that's, that's the biggest concern. Uh, and it's a political one. It's mostly in the United States, but there is uh, work that Japan can do to manage that challenge. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll move on to uh, perceptions and expectations uh, or differences in expectations and perceptions between the US and Japan alliance later on, because that is a really important topic. And yes, we will talk about the budget. That is, that's also, a, you know, that's something that I see on Twitter and various op-eds all the time, but there are a lot of things that we need to discuss there. Um, now, again, when we look at some of the vulnerabilities um, or, you know, some of the issues in alliance, you talked about the politics, and that's definitely true. And that's probably, you know, at the pivot of a lot of things. But what about at the operation models? Do you see any vulnerabilities there? Because, like, for example, again, in the r and reports or various other kinds of op-eds um, and policy briefs and so forth, we often heard complaints about interoperability between the U.S. forces um, and Japan self-defense force, GSDF. Do you think that gap has been filled um, or do you still see some gaps in interoperability or others of these operational areas? I, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do on the operational side. Um, and, and here's what I worry most about. Um, if you imagine a major contingency erupting over Taiwan or even the East China Sea, the question is how would that U.S.-Japan response be carried out today? And I, I don't think it's 100% clear. And there's faults in both countries, in my view. And we've talked about this in the couple of most recent Armitage Nai reports. So in Japan, there's no operational command in the same way that um, the United States has combatant commands. And, and that's sort of natural because, you know, Japan isn't operating all over the world the way the United States is. It's mainly focused in the areas surrounding Japan. But the problem is that you have the chief of staff of the Joint Self-Defense Forces operating sort of as a commander of those forces and the political liaison to the Japanese political leadership all at the same time. And I think that's too much work to do at the same time that that commander would have to be dealing with commanders in Hawaii at Indo-Pacific Command, with political leaders in Washington, that is a huge task. And it's a particularly difficult task if you imagine this occurring under a high stress environment. And so one thing we learned in my view during Operation Tomodachi was that we needed operational commanders that really had authority in a major crisis. And I think Japan has a lot of work to do to realign its operational command arrangements to be prepared for, for example, a Taiwan Strait crisis. But in many ways, the United States has the exact same problem. So yes, we have a combatant commander in Hawaii who's technically in charge of the whole region, but we don't have an operational commander uh, below that level who would be in charge of all of the US services. So 
For example, we have a, a four-star general in charge of the Air Force in the Asia Pacific region. We have a four-star general in charge of the US Army in the Pacific. We have a four-star admiral in charge of the Navy in the Pacific. Um, we have a, a three-star uh, Marine Corps general who's in charge of the Marines in the Pacific. All of those are more senior than the two-star who would be leading operations for Indo-Pacific Command from Hawaii. And to make matters even more complicated, if you imagine a major contingency with China, I think you have to imagine that communications would likely be cut between many of these locations. It might be hard for Tokyo and Washington to talk. It might be hard for Washington and Hawaii, the Indo-Pacific Command to talk, or even from the, for the Indo-Pacific Command to give orders to US forces in the Western Pacific, right? Whether that's Marines in Okinawa, Navy forces sailing or in Yokosuka, um, air forces operating out of various parts of Japan. So this would be a really difficult challenge operationally. And I don't think the United States is prepared for how to command and control its forces in this kind of crisis. I don't think Japan is prepared either. And I definitely don't think we're ready to do this in a combined way. And this is where I'd come back to something I said at the start, which is, I'm not suggesting that we need a combined US-Japan command. That may be too politically difficult, maybe too legally difficult, given the peculiarities of the Japanese constitution and limitations on Japan's self-defense capabilities. But at the end of the day, if you think about a major contingency with China, you know, China is gonna have very clear operational command. Xi Jinping will be in charge. He is in charge of the Central Military Commission that will be running the campaign. Um, we need to be very clear in our own minds about how we would run this campaign ourselves. And so that means clarifying operational responsibilities in Japan, clarifying operational responsibilities in the United States, clarifying how we would work together and actually planning around those kinds of operations ahead of time. So I think that's a huge task for the Alliance over the next five to 10 years. And I know it's something that people at MOD are working on, that people at the Pentagon are working on, but I would just say, I think it probably deserves a little bit more attention than it's gotten, at least from the United States thus far. Yeah, and that's a really good point on that so command structure here in Japan. Uh, you know, the, the person at the top, whether it be at the joint level or in the ground, maritime, and air, that top person is really like a commander and a manager at the same time. And I've talked about this in op-eds and so forth. There's a difference between an operational commander and an operational manager. Um, and that I think definitely needs to get, you know, we need to, Japan needs to get right. Um, and it's really time for Japan to better structure uh, that so you know, or, you know, create some kind of joint force, joint force command or some sort, you know, whether it be one large one or one that is divided into regions. That's definitely one important thing. And I'm glad, you know, you clarified your point about so that combined, no, I mean, you, you said not combined force command of some sort, but, you know, getting some kind of connection and coordination and structuring that between the United States and Japan. Now, I, um, I definitely don't, see that combined force command coming along anytime soon and the reason for that is not just the political and legal ones but also because of the mess that we see over in south korea uh you know regarding upcon transfer and that's the reason why i still think you know i don't think we should go down that path and i don't think we need to go down that path that doesn't guarantee better you know operations that's combined between the united states and japan so that's definitely a really good point that you know uh, that we just touched on now Okay, so we promised to get to this point, our uh, question, and that is, what are the gaps in perceptions and expectations between the United States and Japan? This is probably, you know, the other big vulnerability, uh, if there is any. Um, because if there are gaps in perceptions and expectations, these things will obstruct the formulation and execution of solid alliance strategies readiness, uh, and, and readiness. And when we talk about the gaps in perceptions and expectations, uh, we can look at the, this on uh, you know, various levels. 
Um, you know, one is like US and Japan's perceptions and visions towards the Indo-Pacific security environment. Um, and two, regarding the management of the alliance itself. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about alliance strategies, now, um, you know, we've talked about this before, uh, we've heard each other talk about this before and so forth. You know, we can cut this in various ways. Um, I remember in in podcasts that you did uh, quite some time ago, but I think it was a really good point. You, know, you talked about how, uh, you, you talked about, you know, what the priorities are. And you say like, and, and I remember you, uh, you were debating about, you know, does the United States need to aim for primacy? And I think that, uh, you know, opens up a lot of new questions here. Because when we look at the US-Japan alliance strategy, obviously we want supremacy against our adversaries and competitors. But the question here is supremacy for what? Uh, are we looking for some kind of primacy in the region? Is that what the supremacy is for? Or is it to deny the adversary and competitors from exploiting the region or for, for making further advances to change the status quo? And if I may, I want to add one other, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, sort of not dilemma, but uh, I guess major question is, we also need to think about what the alliance is for overall. Um, you know, is it, should it focus on the free and open in the Pacific and defense of Japan um, and also, uh, you know, defense of uh, US interests and also the United States itself? Um, that is concise and sharp, but the question is, is that enough? Um, on the other hand, should the US-Japan alliance advance to some kind of mechanism or alliance for the global order? That is not just in the Pacific, but working to ensure peace and stability and protection of democracies. That sounds great. And that's ideal in many ways. But at the same time, it risks thinning out the capabilities of the alliance. And that may take away some of the edges of the alliance. Uh, and there's also obviously problems about capacity. So I've sort of thrown a lot of things at you. I've dumped a lot of stuff on you. But what do you think about gaps in expectations and perceptions? This is probably the most important area that I think policymakers in both countries need to work on. I'd say I really worry about two different gaps. So the first gap is on economics. I think it's very clear that Japan knows that um, economics is the most important leverage that Japan has across the Indo-Pacific, right? That's been true for decades. That's why when you look at polling data in Southeast Asia, Japan is remarkably popular, right? That Japan has been very active in supporting smaller economies across the region. And it hasn't been doing that just in response to China. It's been doing this for years. And those deep relationships are incredibly important. But you know, increasingly, if you look at US policy, the US hasn't really had a strong economic component to its engagement. Um, we've talked about needing a strong economic component, but we haven't had one. Uh, we pulled out of TPP. Thankfully, Japan kept pushing with CPTPP. But you know, since then, over the last decade, the US keeps saying that we need high standards trade agreements, but it won't actually join one. And so I think that's the first gap is that Americans, um, they, they know that trade is important in Asia, but they can't actually execute. And, you know, Japan, on the other hand, is very well aware that trade and investment are critical and that high standards trade deals are important and it's actually executed. So I think that's a gap, um, maybe less in perception and maybe more in execution. But to me, that's, that's the biggest gap right now in the US-Japan approach to the Indo-Pacific is that Japan has been a leader on economics and the United States, unfortunately, has not. The, the other gap that I do worry about, and I hate to come back to this again, but I think it's about China. Um, the debate here in Washington has changed so quickly on China that I think it is hard, even for some friends in Japan, who, who pay a lot of attention to the United States to appreciate how quickly the debate has, has shifted. So I remember uh, the week that COVID hit in the United States two years ago, uh, this was really sort of early March, I had a, a group of Japanese scholars visiting from mostly from Tokyo. 
And we were talking about China. And I think a lot of Japanese were surprised at how rapidly the debate had shifted in Washington. But you know, now we've had two years where very few Americans have gone to Japan. Very few Japanese have come to Washington outside of government officials. And um, a lot has changed in both places. Obviously, you know, you've got a new administration in Washington, you've got a new administration in Tokyo, um, but it's also the tenor of the debate that has shifted. And I know it's changed in Japan, but it's changed even more quickly in the United States. And so I think there's a little bit of a risk of a perception gap that um, the US is becoming increasingly hardline on China issues. And I think Japan's debate is shifting, but not as fast. So I think from, from my perspective, those are the two trickiest issues. How do we stay aligned on economics where I think Japan is leading and the US is behind? And then how do we stay aligned on China issues where I think the United States is taking a much tougher line and Japan is behind? Um, and there are no easy answers. Uh, I think this requires just very close alliance coordination, but it can't just be between policymakers or political leaders. It actually has to be among experts and academics and the public. And that's going to be really, really difficult. But those are the two expectation gaps that I worry the most about. Yeah, that's exactly why we have webinars like this, right? Uh, you know, to try to bridge gaps and so forth. Now, on that point about China and also about the debates regarding China, I think that's um, that's a really important point. And again, when we go back to that Taiwan question uh, and or other flashpoints, uh, or other potential threats, we do need to deepen the debates there as well. Um, I, you know, I think you know, um, and when we think about what the U.S. and Japan is doing, or how they see one another, and we'll come back to that point now. I agree, and I've always said that you know, Japan needs to take a, take on a more robust role in our lives. They need to get tough. They need to get sharper. Um, Maybe not necessarily bigger, but they, they definitely need to get sharper on things uh, in terms of capabilities and readiness and so forth. Yet at the same time, I also think the notion of Japan needing to do more or needing to get stronger is often misconceived or taken out of context. That a lot of people get carried away and say, all right, let's get this, let's get that. And you have this, you end up with this huge shopping list or really ambitious policies and strategies. That's probably not going to happen. That's beyond Japan's capacity. And on top of that, you and I, we've always talked about this over emails, uh, you know, over Zoom, like over chats, you know, in the car when you drove in from uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. We need to think about what is good for the damn alliance. We need to come back to that point. It's not just about Japan flexing its muscles more. It's about how Japan can be a better team player. And also vice versa, about how the U.S. can be a better team player in the alliance. Um, the budget, I hear this all the time. and we. You and I, we know about the people that talk about this a lot in the, in the media through our pets and so forth. Yeah, we get that. However, how that budget is spent matters a hell of a lot more. If Japan increases defense budget to 2.0% or 3.0%, whatever, that's not going to mean much if Japan's going to waste its money on capabilities that doesn't need or capabilities that don't help the, uh, the Japanese defense um, or, the, the, or the US alliance. So if you were to make requests to Japan, what would they be? Um, you know, what are the, what are the things that what are the things that you'll say? Hey, look, no, I didn't mean that. Is, is there anything like that that you um, that that comes in your mind? Yeah, th there absolutely is, and you know, we've talked about this a lot. But I I think just to start with, there is a strategy problem here, which is why we're having this discussion in the first place. And, and in my view, you know, a lot of this comes back to the United States. The United States is about to roll out a national defense strategy. And obviously in Tokyo, you're working through a national defense program guidelines, a midterm defense plan, and your own new national security strategy. Ideally, we would be linked up 100% on those efforts. Japan would know exactly what was in the national defense strategy, and it wouldn't just know what's in the strategy it would be part of that strategy, right? It would be shaping the debates in Washington about where the United States is going to invest money. And we would be shaping the debates in Tokyo about where Japan is spending money. 
that doesn't really happen. It should, but it doesn't. And so I think, unfortunately, what's going to happen later this year is that we'll see the U.S. come out with a national defense strategy. It will talk a lot about how the United States needs to do much more, especially in East Asia, um, and, and, you know, putting more troops into the Philippines or more forces or systems into the Philippines is unrealistic. We're not going to put it into Taiwan. Guam is pretty far away. Korea is probably not very realistic. So really, when the U.S. talks about putting more capabilities into the region, it's either talking about naval platforms or it's talking about rotating them through Japan. So you would think that this would be a debate with Japan about what kinds of capabilities we as allies want to develop and that we'd be moving out on those. And that's just not happening. That's not the way the US works, unfortunately. And I think it provides incentives for Japan to also go its own way, right? Especially for the business community. If Japan's defense contractors aren't going to get some of the US defense business why would they work with major US defense companies on Japan's defense equipment needs? And so what you end up getting is, you know, in some cases, decisions that in my view are very inefficient. So both the United States and Japan have talked about needing a longer range anti-ship cruise missile. That would be an ideal capability for us to co-develop, right? We both need the same systems because they're both going to be operating in basically the same places. Um, in fact, many of the operational uses for these kinds of systems would probably be in Japan. So why aren't we co-developing that together? In fact, Japan has a lot of expertise on this. Japan has the, S, uh, has the surface-to-ship missile batteries, the Type 88, the Type 12. These are good systems. The US is trying just to build its first examples of similar systems we should be cooperating in that area. That's very obvious. Um, and you know, two examples of areas where I, I think we're not cooperating enough and I worry that Japan might go down a very expensive avenue. One is the follow-on to Aegis Ashore. And you know, I'm not suggesting that Aegis Ashore was the perfect answer, but I, I think Japan could go down some very expensive pathways like buying new Aegis systems that are seaborne that are going to be very expensive and do basically the same thing that a cheaper Aegis ashore system was going to do. And you know, this is a touchy one, I appreciate, but the FX program, the new fighter program that Japan is developing, um, I'm very nervous that this is gonna be a very expensive platform that there won't be sufficient cooperation between the US and Japan on this platform. And that rather than using this as an area for US-Japan cooperation and maybe even co-development, that Japan's gonna put a lot of money into a largely domestically produced system that will be probably very expensive because it won't be bought in large numbers and might not be that much more advanced than existing systems, especially the F-35 or, or the F-22. And so I worry a lot that um, I don't want to blame Tokyo for this because much of the fault is in Washington because Washington has to actually integrate Japan into our thinking when we develop our defense strategy and we when we develop defense capabilities. And, and we don't do that right now. Um, but that's part of why I think the architecture of the alliance has to change. We actually have to build the infrastructure to allow us to do co-development programs. And today that just isn't really possible. You know, final point, Rio, is the last major co-development program between the US and Japan was SN3 Block 2A. And, you know, that's been a very productive program, but it's pretty shocking that that's the only thing we can point to right now that's a major co-development program on the defense side. I think that's a concerning sign about the degree of interoperability in our forces um, going forward, but also the degree of um, cooperation on force development, really, about what we're going to buy and how we're going to build it. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Definitely. Um, and moving on to a slightly different point, before we talk about the more prescriptive stuff, about one and a half years ago, I think back in 2020, you co-authored a report on linking values to strategies. And I really enjoy that report. 
Um, and from that perspective, how do you see the Biden administration's new Indo Pacific strategy coming in? Or how do you see it from that point of view, viewpoint? Because although, you know, regarding the Biden administration's uh, Indo Pacific strategy, although I was very curious about the timing of the release, um, I also found the document to be fairly flat. Didn't really bring anything new, or at least doesn't keep pace with the rapid and fluid developments that are going on here. Um, and so how do you, you know, see that document in terms of its values and how can we apply that? You know, whatever the values are, I think it's doable between US and Japan, but things are going to get really complicated when it comes to more multilateral stuff, like, you know, US, Japan, Australia, definitely US, Japan, South Korea, um, because the terms like you know, free and opening the Pacific or many of the values noted in that strategy is going to mean different things to different actors. Um, so I was wondering if we can sort of qu uh, quickly touch on that point. Yeah, so the, the report that you mentioned the, on linking values to strategy, um, that was a, an effort uh, by some of us, uh, both on, on the Democratic side and the Republican side, to work together to say, okay, um, Donald Trump was not a good believer in U.S. Uh, or universal values, but actually there's a large group of foreign policy experts in Washington who think that values are important. And I don't mean democracy promotion. I actually mean values in a lot of different areas, right, about how we carry out the order that we think is important in the world, both within our societies and uh, between them. And so we put a report together. It was co-chaired by Avril Haines, who is now the director of national intelligence in Washington. Um, it included Jake Sullivan, who's the national security advisor here. It included Kurt Campbell, the lead on Asia. It was co-written by, by me and uh, my friend, Laura Rosenberger, who's the China lead at the White House. Um, and there are, there are a whole bunch of other uh, Biden administration officials that were involved and as well as some members of Congress. And, and the main point we were trying to make was that if you look around the world, um, there is a set of values that actually a lot of countries want to adhere to. Not all countries buy into all of these values, but in a lot of different areas, they buy into a lot of them. So let me give you some examples. You know, the, the Europeans uh, very much agree with the US and Japan that um, unfair state subsidies in the economic realm deprive us of competition. And we think that competition is uh, the way to generate value, right, in our capitalist societies. And so unfair state subsidies actually undermine competition. And that's a value, even though we don't talk about it that way. We think that open access to information, right, that the internet should uh, be open, that it shouldn't be controlled. We think that's really important. That's a value. Um, Yes, a lot of countries share democratic values. Although actually, you know, when we're talking in Asia, I think it's sometimes tough to talk about the importance of democracy, especially when we're talking in Southeast Asia, yeah. right? And, and this is where the Biden administration has a tricky path. Only three of the 10 members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations were invited to Joe Biden's Summit for Democracy. So it's hard to talk in the region about the importance of democracy if we're saying that most of the region, at least in Southeast Asia, is not democratic. So this is really tricky. But this is why I think when we talk about values, it can't just be about the value of democracy. It has to be a broader view of what values are, right? There are values around security, right? There are values around how we resolve differences between different societies. We don't use the use force to do so or the threat of force. We actually try and do so through negotiation. And I think those values are part of what link the US and Japan to a whole lot of other countries. They certainly link the G7 together, right? The US, Japan, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Italy. Um, they also link, I think, a broader set of countries in the Indo-Pacific including a whole bunch of leading democracies, right? Whether it's Japan or South Korea, Australia, India in many ways, Indonesia, even Malaysia, Philippines at certain times, Singapore. So, so I think there are values that underlie these relationships. 
but it's actually really tricky to talk about them in an Asian context. It's a lot more easy, it's a lot easier for the United States to talk about them in a European context. And um, this is one area where I think Japan has really taken an important leadership role. It has explained why Japan's free and open approach is important, not just to the United States or to Tokyo, but to countries in Southeast Asia. And I think we need more of that explanation and more of that energy. Um, so that's something that I, I think the, the Biden team has struggled to do, to be honest, in part because they haven't engaged Southeast Asia as effectively as, as I know they would like to have done. Um, and then the, just one other comment on the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is there are a lot of really good pieces of the Indo-Pacific strategy, carefully written, very closely coordinated with Japan and other key allies. I think it's important that it was released before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That was a message that the administration is going to stay focused on Asia, even as it deals with the Ukraine crisis. Um, there were no surprises in this document, but in many ways, that's a good thing. Um, and it was also good that uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, presented it first in the Pacific Islands. Um, and also gave a major speech about it in Jakarta, Indonesia. So those are all good signs. The problem, as you said, Rio, is if you read the document, the words all sound good, but there's not a lot of action. Yeah. And I think after a decade in which the United States has been constantly promising that it's going to pivot or rebalance to Asia, but not really doing so, what Asian friends want, and I hear this constantly, is they don't want more promises, they want action. And so now the challenge for the Biden team is how can they turn this strategy, this paper into results? And um, they've got an incredible team. This is many of the smartest people I know in Washington and certainly many of the smartest on Asia. Um, but turning words into reality is tough. And so I think that's the task that they have ahead of them. Yeah, and again, don't get me wrong, like. I agree with what's written there, and I like the way it's written. It's just that, again, as you said, I'm just not sure if it's enough. And that's where, you know, we can move on to the next topic, and that is what should we do or what do we need to do to take the U.S.-Japan alliance to the next level? Because, again, there are a lot of things that we have to do, like, you know, formulating sharper strategies and capabilities or doctrines um, uh, and so forth. You know, close cooperation areas of new emerging technologies. There's a whole list that we can make here. Um, and so it's really about what we can add, right, to what's going on already to meet the uh, uh, demands today. Um, so let's divide a little bit. First, let's look at the strategies. Um, so what kinds of changing strategies or, uh, you know, approaches, uh, you know, can you think of to take nice to the next level? Yeah, the, so the way I've been thinking about this challenge, and I think it relates to the last discussion we were having, is um, I, I think the Alliance has four core challenges, and they're all about coalition building. They're all about how we get a stronger coalition around the key efforts that are in front of us. And so those coalition building efforts, in my mind, we're not going to create one coalition to deal with the China challenge. Um, the reality is that this isn't like Europe in the Cold War. Asia is a different place. It's much more fractured. It's fractured geographically. It's fractured economically. The societies have different ordering mechanisms, right? We're not all democratic. Um, so what we have to do is build different coalitions for different issue sets. And I think there are four critical ones. The first is what I would call security or geo strategy. The second is economics. The third is technology. And the fourth I would call a governance coalition. And I think the most important thing to recognize for Tokyo and Washington is that the US-Japan alliance is at the core of all four of those coalitions. You know, if you think about the security coalition, that's built around US relationships, around US alliances in the region. And the most important US alliance on security issues is the US-Japan alliance. So it's the core of the security lines. And in fact, I would say that's why we've seen the quad, which is really, in my view, about security issues, 
built around the US and Japan, right? We're adding India, we're adding Australia, um, but the US-Japan alliance lies at the core. So what about economics? Well, you know, this again is an obvious one. Other than China, the United States and Japan are the top two uh, economies in the world, not just in Asia. And so if you're gonna build an economic coalition, you have to build it around those two. And yes, you know, Europe is critical in this regard, but in many ways, the United States and Japan are the two leading players economically in building that coalition. And so, you know, whether it's the G7 or some other mechanism, I think we have to build out our agreement with other key countries on our economic strategy. And it has to start with the US-Japan alliance at the core. The third area is technology. And again, who are the most important technology leaders in the world? Well, Japan and the United States are certainly near the top of the list. Um, you know, I think Korea, Germany, uh, Taiwan, you know, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands in some areas, Israel, these are all key players. But the US and Japan in area after area are leading. And so if you're going to build a technology coalition, what, you know, the key principles for that coalition, they're going to be built around what Tokyo and Washington think is important. And then finally, and maybe this is the toughest one for, for Japan, I think we have this global governance coalition. And the question is, how do we want the global order to be structured and how do we actually make that reality? And here, I'd say this is where Japan made the most progress in the last decade. And the Abe administration really deserves a lot of credit for leadership, right? The free and open Indo-Pacific was a concept not just about security or economics. It was also a concept about real governance issues about how we wanted the rules of the road to be written and how we wanted them to be followed. And so I think, you know, on each of these issues, security, economics, technology, and governance, Japan is critical and the U.S.-Japan alliance is critical and maybe at the core of all of those. And so when I look forward in the alliance and think, what do we need to do now? We need to build each of those four coalitions and they're each going to look different, but at the center of them, has to be a clear vision from Tokyo and, Wa and Washington about where we're going and how to get there. And so I think that's the mission now for, for alliance leaders over the next five, 10, 15 years. Yeah, and um, if I can add one thing to that, I also think like engagement with Southeast Asia is gonna be critical. Uh, but that also means like given the specific conditions of Southeast Asia, because you know, the characteristics of the you know, different countries, we do need to be more innovative, though, regarding how we approach and outreach to these Southeast Asian nations, you know, whether it be to form coalitions or, you know, some kind of, you know, quasi alliance or whatever. Now, let's go back to capabilities here. So we talked about the strategies, and now we need to think about the capabilities in order to achieve those strategies. Um, and, and, like, you know, we, when we look at, so, you know, in, Proving the defense readiness of Japan or you know, the alliance. Uh, obviously, you know, you and I, we've talked about capability or readiness for gray zones, uh, including hybrid warfare. That's very important. Um, and there's obviously a lot of discussion here in Japan about uh, with the revision of the national security strategy and then NDPG, uh, you know, by the end of the year. And we're hearing a lot of stuff about strike capabilities. Okay, that's good, right? I agree with that, but. There are also many other important genders as well, like, uh, you know, joint commands, uh, as we have discussed earlier, um, air and naval supremacy. I think that's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Cyber electronic warfare, and also now, of course, information warfare. Um, and, you know, when we think about Taiwan, for example, okay, it may not be this year or next year if, the, if an invasion was to take place. Um, it might be in 2030s or 2040s, whatever. But if we think, if that's a long-term issue or, or threat, that obviously means that we need to do our homework right now. We need to get things right right now because by the time China does that, they're going to be a lot stronger than they are right now, uh, you know, that they are in 2022. So there's a lot of stuff that Japan and United States needs to do. Now I'm currently um, I'm going to shamelessly so you know talk a little bit about my work, but I'm currently working on a book project concerning uh, the prospects and issues for Japan regarding air and naval supremacy. And you and I have talked about this. In fact, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, you know, I looked at um, a, a draft before I published that journal article on Japan's air system supremacy, and that was really helpful. But now that we're moving on to more advanced capabilities, 
you know, when I look at air naval supremacy, particularly naval supremacy on the Japanese side, I think it has to be a good mixture of, you know, offensive operations and asymmetrical operations. Uh, we talked about the Izumo, we talked about F-35 Bravos and many other, so these new fancy gadgets, but that's not all. You know, when I think about naval supremacy for Japan or, you know, sea supremacy for Japan, it also has to think, be a good balance of sea control and sea now, which means Japan needs to invest a lot more in manned, unmanned submersibles um, and naval mines. They are the things that are going to be absolutely critical. Without them, even sea control is going to be undermined. So, you know, although these are not sort of big flashy sort of, uh, uh, you know, sexy weapons that we often talk about, if Japan starts to invest a lot more in these asymmetric capabilities, does that help the uh, Japan-US alliance? Um, and if there's any other capabilities that you think the Japan-US alliance needs, what are they? I absolutely think those asymmetric capabilities are important for the US-Japan alliance. But this is where I think we have to co cooperate very closely to make sure that we're buying the right things. And, and that doesn't just mean Japan, that means the United States as well. Right? There are questions about where these capabilities will be placed and how they'll operate. So take strike capability. Um, you know, where will Japan get the intelligence for those strike capabilities, right? If, if the intelligence is coming from US systems or the command and control is coming from US uh, satellites, that's gonna be important to know. And um, I think the real question here is, uh, why haven't the United States and Japan really thought in more depth about how to do uh, what I would call sea denial, right? Which means preventing China from actually being able to use the sea, use the maritime environment to accomplish its objectives. Um, in my view, the reason is because the United States, and you brought this up earlier, sees itself as the dominant military power in the world. And that means that we want to do air control and sea control and ground control. We don't like having to uh, get by with sea denial or air denial. And, um, you know, this was a luxury that we had for decades. But in my view, this is something that is going to have to shift. Um, it doesn't have to shift everywhere in the world. But near China, where China has a big edge in numbers and a big edge in geography, uh, the U.S. is going to have to rethink whether it's going to be able to actually execute sea control. And if we can't, then shifting more towards a sea denial strategy, at least in some contingencies, would make sense. And it certainly makes sense for Japan. But this is the kind of really tough allied uh, cooperation that is difficult if we don't have the architecture in place to have very concrete discussions about what Japan is buying and what the US is buying and what our vision is for how to use these systems. And I think unfortunately right now, um, we absolutely have some very thoughtful leaders in both countries who are willing to have these debates. But I think it's hard to have a very concrete discussion, for example, about when strike capability will be useful in an alliance context, because we don't really have um, the alignment we need to have, not just on our strategies, but on capability development or on operational execution. And until we have that, I think this kind of discussion is gonna be really difficult. So in my view, um, yes, sea dial would make a lot of sense for Japan. It would make some sense for the United States as well, but I'm not sure that leaders in either country are really willing or uh, willing at the moment to have uh, serious discussions about how to do this in an alliance context. And, and that has to change. Yeah. And that's again, our job, right, to sort of shake the necks of our leadership and say, hey, look, this is what we need to pay attention to. Um, yeah, and so, again, you know, what we, what I sort of learned from our conversation today is it's really about reconfiguration in a lot of areas. Um, and, and when we, uh, I'm now going to sort of move on to uh, some questions and comments that, you know, I'm, I'm getting up, getting on this Zoom thing here. There are some good questions here that I think, you know, we should turn to. Um, Again, for anyone, uh, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, now, I'm going to look at this one This one in particular that's really good. Um, 
How would Japan or the United States respond to a stronger China-Russia alliance? Now, one thing that we need to be careful of here, I'll be careful with using the word alliance because I don't think it's gone that far. I'm not sure, Zach, if you agree with me on that. It's more like a, I don't know, like dating between two people that see something that's really convenient. Uh, it's like a marriage, it's like a, um, a relationship of convenience, which Paul Deep has often talked about. So what do you think there? You know, China, Russia, cooperation or partnership um, and how would Japan and U.S. respond to that? So we yeah, still need to go into lightning mode because of time constraints. Yep, yep. Right, yeah. And I'll, so, I'll yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, but yeah, I, it's such an interesting question. Uh, so my short view is that I, I would have said even fairly recently that I thought Russia-China cooperation was a little overplayed and that we didn't see that much actual real cooperation between the two. But I have to say, if you read the statement that they put out about 10 days ago, um, it's quite remarkable. Um, it covers a lot of territory. It, it talks about you know everything from uh, Russia-China cooperation on Central Asia to opposing uh, the release of wastewater from Fukushima um, one thing after another, right? And I think it's a bit of a signal that um, Russia and China are feeling more and more pushed together, not just by the United States, but by others around the world. And, you know, there's an obvious reason for this. If you look at the top economies around the world, there really are only two. And, and you know, I'm being generous here, calling Russia a top economy. It's, I think, number 11. But um, there really are only two that are autocratic. And so it makes sense in some ways for Russia and China to look for ways to cooperate because they've got no one else. And I think what we're seeing around Ukraine is that the Russians are desperate for China's support. And China is willing, surprisingly, to actually um, tacitly support Russia you know, invading sovereign territory, despite the fact that China talks constantly about um, non-intervention and you know, the affairs of sovereign states. Uh, and so um, we're seeing China being willing to bend its principles to align more closely with Moscow. And I think, you know, I'm not sure that Moscow has many principles at this point, but if they, if they did, then I think Vladimir Putin would be perfectly happy to adjust them to align more closely with Xi. So, so my personal view is we're going to see very close alignment between Russia and China for years ahead. You know, I'm not saying that that couldn't change in the future, um, but I think it's good to remember that the, the Sino-Soviet split, which, you know, the U.S. took advantage of in the 1970s, that started in the 1950s, and it took a good 15 years before it was um, a deep enough split that we could take advantage um, of, of it. So, you know, while Vladimir Putin is in charge of Russia, I just can't see that being a real reality. Um, and so I think it's going to require us to think carefully about how we work to challenge not just uh, China and Asia or Russia and Europe, but how to challenge the ideas that both of them have about how they want to rewrite the rules of the current order. Um, and I think that's something that Japan uh, can take a leading role in doing, but it's going to mean some um, even tougher discussions with the Russians than I think Tokyo has had in recent years. Yeah, um, and again, like I think there's a lot that we have to study here. I mean, I know that this whole China-Russia thing is a, one of the hottest topics in town in DC right now. Um, you know, I see all these webinars popping up in my inbox about that. But again, it's about how to get these things right. Um, you know, how to read China right, how to read Russia right, um, because there's going to be different answers, um, you know, based on how deep we look into these two countries, um, not just the partnership itself. Okay, so another question I'm getting here is what concrete contribution should, could Japan make in the face of um, contingency in the Taiwan Straits? Um, uh, we look at so logistical support or some kind uh, or material monetary support. Um, and if so, if those are things that Japan does, is that enough from the US side? And I think this goes back to our debate about expectations, but well, let's you know keep it simple here. What kinds of contributions do you, do you think the U.S. expects from Japan 
in the case of uh, contingency in the Taiwan Straits? Yeah, so so I've been discussing with this uh, this question with some some friends in Tokyo for a while, and I think it really falls into two categories. Um, one is we need basing access in Japan, um, and I'm not just talking necessarily about American bases in Japan. I, I think you can imagine a world in which we have to use Japanese civilian airfields or even civilian ports as well. Um, so basing access is one thing. And then the other would be um, operational contributions, by which I mean Japan actually taking part in uh, specific operations, whether that would mean directly uh, fighting with Chinese forces or maybe you know, convoying uh, ships to Taiwan, I, I don't know. But this is where, you know, those are the two areas uh, where we need help. But the real question is, what scenarios are we talking about? And I think there are a whole series of very different scenarios from a Japanese point of view. So let's take the most maximalist scenario, which is um, China decides to invade Taiwan. It decides to uh, do so by launching a massive attack against not just US forces in the Western Pacific, but against Japan as well. And I don't mean just US bases in Japan, I mean Japanese forces themselves. In that scenario, I think the American expectation is that the US and Japan are gonna be in a fight for our life um, and that we're gonna expect Japan to do just about everything it can to cooperate with the US, whether it's basing access, whether it's joint operations against Chinese forces. Um, you know, if, if China launches a major uh, attack uh, unprovoked against both the US and Japan, um, I think that'll be the expectation. Now, you know, that's a very different scenario from one in which, for example, Chinese forces try and do a quarantine or a blockade of Taiwan, and the United States is trying to relieve Taiwan by convoying ships uh, or, or aircraft uh, to Taiwan to provide uh, support. You know, in that case, I don't think we're going to be expecting Japan necessarily to be launching strikes on Chinese forces. In fact, the U.S. might not be launching strikes on Chinese forces, um, but we probably would still expect a lot of base access. So I'd say the, the question on Taiwan is not just what can Japan do, it's also what, what does this scenario look like? And this is why I think our operational uh, commanders need to be talking in great detail because there's no easy answer. It's not just, here's what Japan needs to do in a Taiwan contingency. You know, there are dozens of Taiwan contingencies and each of them is gonna be different. And so we need to be actually simulating these scenarios. We need to be practicing them to understand politically what to expect in different cases. And, um, you know, I, I think that's very doable but it's not something we've really done historically in the Alliance. So um, it would take a lot of effort for political leaders to sit down and actually talk through some of these situations and what the expectations would be. But I think we've got to do that now because the worst thing that could happen is to wake up in the middle of a crisis and find out that either Japan isn't doing what the US expected or the United States isn't doing what Japan expected. That would be a real leadership failure. So we have to get ahead of that by planning now for what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, and we definitely don't want to underestimate what can go on. Or we don't want to overestimate either, uh, but we definitely don't want to underestimate um, you know, what could go on. But again, this comes back to the point about you know the need to understand China correctly, the need to understand Russia correctly, and of course, even now, the need to understand Taiwan properly and the Taiwan, so-called Taiwan problem properly as well. That is something that we do need to think about in order to do all this scenario planning and contingency planning and all that kind of stuff. Because otherwise we're going to end up with, you know, uh, you know, some plans or strategies that are not going to work in times that you know, we really need it to work. Um, okay, and that brings us to another question and that is, okay, for, the, for Japan, the Japan-US alliance uh, is, is really important. It's at the center. However, how does the U.S.-Japan alliance in terms of you know security of the United States? You know, so it has, you know, you know, 
I guess, you know, this person sort of talking about rank, ranking a little bit or priority, but how much of priority is it for the universe? What can I do to maintain the alliance or to improve the alliance? Yeah, this is a fascinating question. I, I think if you ask most Americans what the most important alliance is for the United States, the answer you'll get is NATO. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that. It's some of this is just the historical connection that Americans have to Europe. Um, some of this is cultural connections and, and frankly, just the similarities in language with some of the Europeans. Um, but it's also, it's a little bit deeper than that, right? It's, it's a view that there's sort of a shared transatlantic history and culture that in some ways uh, goes back a longer ways than, than what we have uh, with Japan. And um, so I think most Americans would say, look, if you're asking, you know, which allies are the most important, well, it's the Europeans and it's always been the Europeans. Um, you know, I've made the argument here that I actually think Japan is the most important ally we have and it's in the most important region. Um, so I, it's not to denigrate the importance of our allies in Europe but is to say that, you know, the biggest challenge the United States has today is China and the top ally we have to deal with it is Japan. Um, but I don't think that's the way most Americans look at this. And part of the challenge is that um, the easiest alliances seldom get the most attention. And don't get me wrong, the US-Japan alliance has not always been easy and, and friends in Tokyo know this better than friends back in, in Washington here. But you know, the last decade, the US-Japan alliance has been about as easy as it gets, right? We had the Abe administration, which was very pro-US in many ways. We've had consistency under Suga and now under Kushida. Um, there hasn't been a lot of consistency in terms of American leadership. And yet the Trump administration, its best alliance relationship was definitely with Japan. Right, the US-NATO relationship was terrible. US-Korea was even worse. US-Australia was even very uh, unsteady for a while. Um, and you know, the relationships with the Philippines and Thailand, the other two treaty allies in Asia were you know, really on a bad downhill path. And so I would say, you know, in some ways, Japan doesn't get that much attention because the US-Japan alliance has been easy the last decade. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that means that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to it in Washington. And we think that if we just allow the US-Japan alliance to continue on its current path, then that's fine. But I'll, I'll tell you, that's not my view. You know, I, My view would be because the US-Japan alliance is so important and because we've been able to accomplish so much the last decade, that means that we actually have to be really ambitious about what we're trying to do the next decade. Um, and that's why in our last Armitage and I report, we titled it more important than ever. And I believe the subtitle is something along the lines of, you know, an ambitious agenda for the US-Japan Alliance. And I think that's what we need. We need ambition. And I'll be candid here and say that I, I don't think we've seen an ambitious alliance for the agenda, the ambitious agenda alliance out of Washington under Biden under Trump or under Obama. Um, I think a lot of the leadership has come from Tokyo. And, and a final thought, which is this isn't entirely bad, right? I, you know, for years, I think people have been complaining that there has been too much leadership from Washington and not enough from Tokyo in the US-Japan alliance. And so it's in some ways a positive that Japan is now leading and really thinking about the alliance so deeply. But that means the US has to catch up a little bit and we have to do the hard work to figure out where we want the alliance to go tomorrow. We can't just rest on our laurels. We can't just accept the alliance as it is today. Yeah. And that, I think you made a really good point about sort of how we should sort of take it to the next level. Um, and this, I guess, you know, sometime, you know, when we get older and when we're wiser, 
it's where we can write so like a Kuga Kinati and Gucci report, you know, on how to sort of take the alliance to the next level to deal with the various threats. Now I'm gonna abuse my authority as moderator and discussant. Uh, and I'm gonna have one question of my own, and that is all right, US rock US Japan rock trilateral. We've talked we talk about this all the time, we heard all the time, we hear complaints about all the time and you know, if I had a baby here, there's various ways I can describe the situation regarding US Japan uh, create trilateral. How can we make it work? Any ideas? Because uh, I think we need yeah. a lot of ideas here. Yeah, you're the expert here. Uh, so I'll just give you a couple oh. of ideas on, on my side. Um, first, uh, I think it is important, you know, I, and, and this is clear in the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy that um, it is very awkward for the United States to have two of its closest allies uh, in the same region have such a tense relationship. And I think it makes it difficult, not just when it comes to North Korea, but also when it comes to China. So yes, uh, I think it's, it's logical for the United States to want a closer Japanese relationship with Korea and vice versa. Um, now, the US can't make it happen on its own. And the US could put a lot of effort into Japan-Korea cooperation and not make very much progress. And I think that would be a shame. So my personal view is we have to wait for the timing to be right. And that means mostly the timing in Tokyo and Seoul. I'm hopeful that after we see elections in both countries later this year, that that might be good timing, right? Once we see the results of the election in Korea, um, we'll see what new leader they have and whether that new leader is open to trilateral cooperation or even bilateral cooperation with Japan. And then I think we'll have to see how the Kishida administration does later this year in elections as well. And um, I think it's possible to imagine that you could get leaders in both countries who would be willing to come to the table and say, yes, of course, there are going to be continuing differences over history issues um, over, you know, current day issues between Japan and Korea, but we have to put those behind us. And um, I don't want to be overly optimistic because I think this is a real challenge and, you know, it's not America's place to lecture Korea or Japan about the importance of this cooperation. Mm -hmm. But I would just say at the end of the day, um, the United States has some really tough tasks ahead of us, not just in Asia, but around the world. And you know, think about an area like technology cooperation, where Japan and Korea are two of the leading technology uh, innovators in the world. If we can't get on the same page on supply chain issues, for example, it's gonna be really difficult to come up with a coherent coalition on technology issues. So yes, I understand all the reasons that cooperation in a trilateral forum is difficult, but I think we have to have pragmatic leadership. And let me just say a final thing, which is, you know, when I look back and I look at the world that existed after World War II, and I think about the place that the US-Japan relationship started and where we ended up even by the 1950s, you know, it's hard for me to believe that if the US and Japan can come that far in such a short period of time, that we can't see real advances in Japan-Korea ties over a decade, right? There's a logical reason to do this um, and it won't be easy. And it's up to Japanese and Korean leaders to, to lead on this effort. But I think the US should be, should be encouraging. Yeah, and same applies for uh, Japan-Australia relations as well. I mean, the relations were really bad, even when I was like school in the 1990s, uh, but Look at where it is now. Uh, a lot of hard work put in there, um, and and so I don't. I think it's wrong to think that you know a lot of uh, you know I hear this a lot in Japan and in Korea. I think it's wrong to think that you know Japan Korea cooperation is unnecessary um, or that it's a threat or whatever. You know, I think that I think that's wrong. Right? Uh, but again, I also can't see it being possible without that trilateral aspect to it. You know, with the United States, we need to do this as a team, right? As a triangle not as a two sets of bilaterals or three, sorry, three sets of bilaterals, right? I think it has to be a triangle there. Uh, but, and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we have to debate there. Um, okay, 
All right. Um, and so it seems like you know, also the last one. Uh, but so now we're now reaching the end of the session. Um, and you know, it's been a great conversation. And I think what we see is that you know the Chinese alliance has advanced well, but the threats and challenges are growing at a much faster rate. Uh, which is why the alliance needs to do not only more but reconfigure itself to the right level of effectiveness and efficiency. That's what I think I learned you know, from you know, um, you know, your points today. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and so, uh, Zach, you've given us a lot of things to chew on to further develop the Japan Union Alliance to deal with the threats and challenges. Um, so, again, um, you know, as always, thank you so much, uh, you know, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we'll be working together again soon on these matters. Um, you can expect lots of emails from me in the coming weeks and coming years and decades. Um, and so, yeah, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rio. It's really a delight to get to see you and uh, so many, so many friends uh, there in Japan. And you know, thank you not not just to you, but the whole team at the University of Tokyo and Rolls for uh, hosting this this discussion. And I hope to see you and and many other friends in Japan in person soon. So uh, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll go to DC as well. Uh, you know, hopefully when things get better. Uh, I'll when the corona uh, stuff uh, works out. But in the meantime, uh, you know, definitely, you know, there's a lot that we can work on, uh, you know, work on together, you know, uh, virtually and so forth. Um, yeah, so again, a lot of stuff that we had to work on, but the, today's session really showed us how, you know, we sort of set the, the road ahead, right? Or we at least, you know, put our thoughts into, uh, shared our thoughts on, you know, what needs to be done ahead. And so I think it's a really positive step, um, you know, not only between, us, but also between Japan and the United States. And so I think um, you know, it was a really great session. So that's it for this session. Uh, thank you all for joining us today here at Rolls, and we'll be bringing you more events soon to think together about the challenge Japan faces and steps that need to be taken. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. And in the meantime, please take care and also wish you all the very best. So thank you. See you. Bye.